Every one of us makes decisions in our job every day. It's kind of what we're hired to do. Um, I'm going to tell you the story of the worst decision I made, in, well, to date, in my 21-year career as a web developer and engineering manager. <laughs> in September of 2014, I was managing one of three teams building the marketing pages on Apple.com. The date we're going to focus on is specifically September 8th, 2014. Um, the next day, Tim Cook was, would get on stage and make a few product announcements. He would announce the iPhone 6 and Apple Watch. This is also the launch where Apple pushed this album by some obscure 80s band to 500 million iPhones. And this, for some reason, pissed off a lot of people. <laughs> it was also the launch that gave us this, which Apple being Apple uh, tried to play off as not at all awkward, but the internet didn't buy it. <laughs> so to recap, it's, uh, it's one day before a major launch. Um, iPhone 6, Apple Watch, Apple Pay launched uh, that launch as well. Big important launch. So my team was building um, the front end for Apple's first foray into what we called social, called Apple Live. Apple Live combined a live stream of the keynote with a live blog of related content. Kind of like if, you, if uh, YouTube and Twitter uh, had a baby, but Pinterest was secretly the father. Um, we decided, well, not me, but folks above my pay grade, uh, to greenlight Apple Live just a few weeks before the event. So the first commit to the repo for the uh, front end code was just six weeks before the launch. Um, the team from that point on was working 12 to 16 hour days, including weekends, to get it ready. Um, this kind of thing was kind of par for the course for our group at Apple, so you know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so, We'll start to talk about the decision that I made that I'm calling my worst decision at Apple, but I'm, first a little context. So um, the architecture for the live blog was actually really simple and smart. We used a CMS to generate a JSON file describing the page contents and push that to an Amazon S3 bucket whenever a change was made. The file was then picked up by Akamai, which um, is one of the world's biggest content delivery networks and served to end users from one of their tens of thousands of servers around the world. Users' web browsers would then uh, pull for the JSON file every 10 seconds or so, flowing in new content, uh, content as it was added to the feed. Um, do you remember Safari 6? Maybe, I don't know, it doesn't look that different than what we have now, but anyway, that was the current version of Apple's browser at the time. Um, so this was the day before the launch. Uh, we were testing something, and we were seeing Safari, uh, in particular, aggressively caching the JSON file uh, containing the blog content. This means it was taking far longer than 10 seconds for users to see new content as it was added to the feed. Now, because it was our browser, um, Apple.com had to work flawlessly in Safari. Uh, remember, this is t less than 24 hours before the start of a major launch event, so we're kind of panicking a little bit uh, seeing this behavior. Um, and before I continue with uh, my decision, I'm gonna, let's talk a little bit about um, sort of considerations around decision making. When making a decision of any consequence, it's Prudent, I'd say, to keep in mind these four things. So risk, impact, reversibility, and timeliness. Yes, we are hired to make decisions, but there are times when it's appropriate for someone sort of higher up the food chain to assume the risk for certain decisions. So especially if you're an individual contributor. The wider and more severe the potential impact of a decision, um, the more people you should advise uh, to, you should pull in to advise you on it. If the decision is more of a one-way door than a two-way door, in other words, if it's if it would be hard to revisit the decision after it's been made and, and change course, then you should be more thorough in making the, the decision. Um, and there are times when you need a decision now, in which case you may be forced to bend some of the kind of above stated rules. But when you do bend the rules, you should do everything you can to give the decision greater transparency. So as my CEO at Zapier put in a recent um, internal blog post about decision making, for decisions made in the open, we all share some responsibility. Conversely, for decisions you make in isolation, the responsibility lands squarely on you. Foreshadowing alert. <laughs> okay, you'll recall we're having a problem with Safari aggressively caching the JSON feed. What I suggested to the engineer was to add a JavaScript timestamp as a query string uh, to the JSON requests. To make it concrete, the original URL for the JSON feed was something like this. Um, we changed it to this, where the, uh, the number after the query string inc incremented every thousandth of a second. The way URLs work, um, and most, well, you know, some of you may know this, that the same base URL with a different query string is considered a new resource. So the first time the browser sees that URL, it fetches the data from the server. Subsequent requests may be cached. 
Sure enough, we saw the latest data with every, with every uh, request. Problem solved, right? Those few characters, that single line of JavaScript, essentially made our JSON file uncacheable. So with hindsight, this was an obviously boneheaded suggestion on my part, but in the overworked, sleep-deprived heat of the moment, um, even with my, you know, since January 1st, 1998 years of front-end experience, I didn't see the implications. One of my best developers, the person who, you know, implemented the fix, didn't either. Our QA team, team didn't notice any problems. But in the end, no excuses, no way around it. This was a really terrible decision on my part. So after pulling a Diet Coke fueled all-nighter, verifying bug fixes and adding polish to uh, animations that, if we're being honest, were probably fine the way they were, <clears throat> the inevitable march of time meant that uh, the launch quickly approached. So when you're at Apple, you're on a, uh, you're on a big stage. Um, this event would be the third largest uh, streaming event on the web up to that point. Millions of people loaded up Apple Live to watch the keynote and experience the live blog. My developers, Garrett and Jim, uh, are terrified. <laughs> like me, they also didn't sleep uh, the night before. So the event starts, Tim Cook walks out on stage, the first tiles are pushed out to users. Apple Live was actually a really nice experience when it worked. <clears throat> About 20 minutes into the keynote, systems that should not have been feeling much, much stress were, were being severely stressed. So users started seeing 503 server errors as Akamai passed pretty much every request through to the Amazon S3 bucket um, instead of serving from cache, thus overwhelming S3, which is pretty hard to do. Um, with so much traffic passing through to the origin servers, we were having to request that Akamai raise our bandwidth limits, which is very, very expensive. Uh, almost, you could call it extortion, maybe. The, um, the sheer number of requests, millions of users times a request every 10 seconds, started to degrade Akamai's global availability <laughs> from their usual 99.999% down to about 96.5%. This is very likely super expensive for them because they're breaking service level agreements with hundreds or thousands of their uh, cust customers. All of the above put stress on the systems delivering the video feed, which was also served by Akamai. That led the video feed to fail over to a backup feed, which was, and this part is not my fault, misconfigured, resulting in all users globally receiving a feed meant only for internal testing that included an overdub of the keynote translated into Mandarin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At this point, we have a, a crisis, a legitimate crisis. So Apple's biggest asset is their brand. The, the whole disaster is what you might characterize as, I don't know, off-brand. Um, let's just say you don't want to be the person who causes a situation that one of your biggest competitors uses to create a parody ad. Um, or the person who causes articles like this to be published. Uh, that last sentence in particular cuts like a knife. Uh, I can't help but wonder what Steve Jobs would say about this. Ouch. My boss and I both expected to be fired over this. Um, to our leadership's credit, credit, they didn't fire anyone, but they actually recognized that they had put us in a really difficult position by greenlighting such a complicated process so close to the event. But at the time, I didn't know that. So I spent the next couple of days recovering from the most stressful day of my professional life by staring at San Francisco Bay, second guessing pretty much everything about my life. I'm wondering if it'd be better off just living out my days here, eating whatever washed up from the sea. It was, it was terrible. It's relatively easy to make good, considered decisions when you're rested, not under stress, uh, have all the necessary information, et cetera. When those conditions are not in place, something that can help you still make sound decisions is employing some kind of system for decision making. Surprise, I used one. Um, at the time, I didn't have quite as many decision-making tools in my tool belt, so the one I employed was uh, something called the OODA loop. The OODA loop was developed by an ace fighter pilot in World War II, and was highly effective for that purpose. Um, unfortunately, for September 2014 me, uh, it was, it's optimized for decisions that can be made in isolation. So, yes, using a decision framework helps, but um, really only if you use the right one. So a better framework for decision-making, um, the, the decisions that affect systems and organizations is DACI. Uh, DACI is a, a, a framework originally developed at Intuit, Intuit um, and that we use at Zapier where I work. One of the main things DACI does is define roles within the decision-making process. DACI is an acronym. So the D stands for driver, the person responsible for involving the right people, collecting the right information, and driving the process to a decision. A is for approver, the one person who makes the decision. C is for contributors, people with knowledge or expertise that can influence the decision. 
And I is for informed, as you may have guessed, it's the people who need to be informed of the final decision. So let's apply DAC to my situation um, on September 8th, 2014. Adding that, ti that timestamp time stamp to the JSON request was literally one of hundreds of decisions I made over the course of the project. I clearly didn't realize just how risky the decision was, but had I been in the habit of using DAC, it could have helped me mitigate my blind spots. So uh, the driver would have been the developer who was seeing the problem, um, the browser cache caching problem, the approver would have been me. Uh, contributors would have included at least uh, the manager of the team that architected the backend system. Um, informed would have included our QA team, probably. So my decision was a bad one, but my real mistake was that instead of Daisy, I basically left it at day, like just the two of us, right? Had I included the right contributors, the whole disaster probably, probably would have been avoided. So the moral of the story is uh, don't be like 2014 me. <laughs> when making consequential decisions, uh, use a decision-making framework appropriate to the situation. Thank you. <laughs>